Hi, this is Troy Peterson from BJB. Rigid and flexible polyurethane foams offer unique capabilities for producing a wide variety of parts. We developed this video to address basic processing techniques and to answer common questions BJB's encountered over the years. Whether you're a novice or an expert in casting, using foam to produce high quality, consistent parts can present challenges not seen in other casting materials. Our goal at BJB is to take the mystery out of materials, so let's get started. BJB manufactures two distinct types of castable foams, rigid and flexible. The rigid foams are closed cell and come in a variety of densities. They work well in applications for flotation, prototypes, and even lightweight backup for tools. At lower densities, they're easy to sand and carve. At higher densities, they can actually hold nails and staples or be structural enough for lightweight furniture. BJB's flexible foams also come in a variety of densities, but there are choices between compressible, cushion-style foams and firmer, self-skinning foams that feature an integral skin. Some people confuse our cushion-style foams to be self-skinning because they do form a smooth surface when cast into a closed mold, but they don't form the distinct rubbery skin that our self-skinning foams can produce. Flexible foams are commonly used for movie props, prototypes, molded cushions, and bumpers. A common question we receive about polyurethane foams is whether they can be cut or shaped with a hot wire process. The short answer is no. They'd have to be mechanically shaped or sanded once the foam is cured. Density is rated by how much a foam weighs in a given volume. We rate it in pounds per cubic foot. Don't confuse density simply by how flexible foam compresses. There's more to it than that. When you compare one of BJB's four pound cushion style foams to a four pound self skinning foam, you can start to see the difference in characteristics. The cushion style foam is soft and easily compressible, while the self skinning foam is much firmer. Now to further illustrate the concept of density in a given volume, we take a one cubic foot box with no lid. If you take an 8 pound density foam, it should take roughly 8 liquid pounds to expand and fill the box. The same holds true of a 4 pound density foam. 4 liquid pounds should expand to fill the same box. So the resulting density would be half as much when compared to the 8 pound foam. Now, if this box were a mold for foam, it'd be considered free rise because the foam can grow unrestricted. Putting a lid on it with a vent for trapped air to escape during expansion, we now have a closed mold causing back pressure. That simple vent is perhaps one of the most critical elements in a tool for foam. Its size and placement will control the part's surface finish and true density. So now that we've gone through the theory of free rise versus back pressure, we're going to demonstrate it using this clear acrylic box. Now this box has already been waxed three times with our McGuire's 87 and then a very light spray of our rocket release to help slip the part out a little bit easier. We'll go more over the releases later on in the video. So I'm going to do this demonstration with our TC277 four pound self skinning flexible foam. I have 240 grams mixed up and when expanded should fill this box unrestricted. Now to mix the foam we have a couple of options. We could look at using a Jiffy mixer with the drill this is our smallest, the LM. We could also hand mix using a wide spatula. For this demonstration, I'm going to hand mix so you can see how fast and thorough you have to mix it and how quickly you've got to get it into the mold. So here we go. I'm going to pour the A into the B. The A is lower in viscosity and will run a little easier. So I'm starting to mix. I'm mixing really quickly, mixing thoroughly. Got to scrape the sides well. Give it a little bit more of a mix. And it's about ready to go in the mold. I'm going to pour the majority of the material in here, but I can't pour every last drop because the foam starts to react, viscosity raises, and I also don't want to end up with any unmixed material that's sticking to the sides and bottom of the cup to end up in the part. So here we see the foam rising. It grows like a loaf of bread. 
the side walls of the mold are actually dragging down and rounding off the top, the center of the mold is going to rise to the path of least resistance. So at this point the expansion rate is slowing down, the foam's pretty much reached the top level of the box. Now some things to note with regard to how much the foam will actually expand in the end would be the liquid temperature prior to mixing. Higher temperatures give you more reaction. Secondly would be what you mixed with. Did you hand mix? Did you jiffy mix? And did you hand mix thoroughly or slow or fast? Third would be the relative humidity in the air. More humidity actually makes more reaction. And last would be the actual geometry of the mold. If you have a tall, skinny, narrow mold, there's going to be more surface friction all going up along the sides, and you may get less expansion, so you have to add more foam. A nice open box like this does a pretty easy job. So I've gone and demolded our free rise foam, and you can see it's pretty soft, and there's not a real heavy skin. We're going to see what we can get in a closed mold situation. We're going to be mixing up 300 grams of material. That's 20% more than our first batch. We need to account for the increased back pressure. We also hand mix the first batch. We're going to do a jiffy mixer. We have to mix for about the same amount of time, but it's a lot less manual labor. Okay, here we go. The key with the jiffy mixer is that the jiffy mixer is completely submerged. You're not trying to froth the foam. Let the foam achieve its own gas. Okay, here we go. And I'm just going to lightly apply the pressure of the lid. You can see the foam's rising to the top. Hits in the center first. Then the last bit of air begins to get expelled at the four corners of the vents. I'm allowing a little bit of this pressure to escape. I don't want to build up too much pressure in the plexiglass box. So you can see the difference between from the first run of foam to the second with the lid. We've filled out to the corners and we've allowed the air to escape. If we had put a vent right in the center, we actually would have ended up with quite a few voids in the corners. So you need to account for the way the foam is going to grow. Every mold is different and every geometry of part is going to be different. A common observation by customers after casting and demolding a flexible foam part is that a few hours later the part exhibits shrinkage or is sucked back in a few areas. This is due to trapped gas in the cell structure slowly exiting the foam, causing cells to shrink. We found that by squeezing or exercising the foam expels trapped gas and replaces it with atmospheric air. This should be done within about 30 to 60 minutes after demold to avoid any potential shrinkage issues. The other component to proper mold design with foam concerns orientation of the mold. In other words, positioning the mold to control the flow of expanding foam towards the vents. On a part like this thin armrest, it seemed logical to add multiple vents in the mold like this. But in reality, it'd be better to have a couple of vents near the extreme corners of the part and angle the mold to allow the vents to be at the high point. Fewer vents will allow more back pressure to build and form a nicer skin on the part. If you cast this mold flat and level, the foam will rise upward and close out the vents before all the air can be displaced. This trapped air can be forced back into the part and you will have issues with voids and inconsistent cell structure. Angling the mold uses gravity and the natural growth of the foam to direct air out in an organized manner. Considering castable foams tend to be very fast reacting, how do you get the foam into the mold, close it, and orient it within the short amount of working time? You can save yourself a lot of time and headaches using creative solutions like this mold. Using a hinge and a quick clamp system, you simply mix, pour in the liquid, close the mold, clamp it, and then orient the mold vertically so the strategically placed vent is at the high point. One last note on this subject would be to mention how important it is to have a well sealed mold to prevent leakage out of the areas aside from your vents. This mold is at least 30 years old, could use some readjustment itself. Let your vents determine how much back pressure is created and adjust as needed. The combination of how much foam is poured into the mold, quantity and size of the vents, plus the material your mold is made from are all part of the equation. There's a tremendous amount of pressure that can be produced by expanding foam, so always be aware of this and take precautions. If you plan to overpack the mold to produce a higher density foam or a much denser skin, make sure your mold can handle the pressures.
are a variety of suitable materials you can use to make molds for foam. Much of this is driven by personal preference or availability of materials. Some mold materials are quick and easy to produce, but may sacrifice longevity or complexity. Some require more prep work and labor up front, but will last for many years. Let's discuss some of these options along with their attributes. Silicone tools are typically easy to make, capture high levels of detail, and are naturally self-releasing. They need to have some sort of rigid backup structure or mother mold to contain the high internal pressures produced by foam. They may not have the longevity of other tool materials, but work good for low volume applications. Plaster has been a material used for many years in the special effects industry because it's low cost and easy to use for quick one-off molds. Our Challenge 90 mold release is popular to seal and release plaster tools. Laminated fiberglass is popular for larger tools. Used in conjunction with the surface coat, it forms a rigid, lightweight tool that can be highly polished. Castable urethanes like our TC1630 or TC816 have become popular mold materials for foams because they are rigid, fast turnaround, and low cost. Castable epoxies like our aluminum filled TC1650 and TC1651 have always made great production tools for foam. The advantages are their increased thermal conductivity, ability to hold high pressures, and maintain a long tool life. With the widespread availability of CNC machining equipment, metal tools have become more cost effective for production tools. Some people are even experimenting with 3D printed technology for foam tools. So the technology in molds is always evolving. BJB offers a nice variety of mold releases depending on the material used in the construction of your mold. Meguiar's Mirror Glaze No. 87 is a carnauba based paste wax best used on rigid tools without too much surface texture. It buffs on and off easily to produce a high gloss finish. Challenge 90 is a solvent based liquid mold release that's typically wiped into the tool. Easy to use, dries quickly, and great for highly textured molds. E302 Rocket Release is an aerosol spray release that works well in addition to Wax or Challenge 90 to add a bit more slip to help get parts out. A few light mist coats is all that you need. E497 Thermoset is another aerosol spray release. Sprays on wet but dries with a matte, waxy film. It helps to dry with a little bit of compressed air, works great in flexible silicone tools, machine metal tools, and other forms of rigid tooling. E236 is a very popular silicone based mold release in use with BJB's line of non-foaming cast urethane products. We do not recommend it for use with foams because it can disrupt the surface quality of non-skinning and self-skinning foams. BJB's polyurethane foam systems can be colored using our 6800 series pigments. These highly concentrated pigments are typically added at 1 to 2% of the total weight of A and B together. So if you were mixing 100 grams of foam, you should only need about 1 to 2 grams of pigment. If you add too much pigment, you can start to have problems with the cell structure and overall quality of the foam. This is one reason why we don't recommend measuring pigment by eye. It's very difficult to be accurate. Using a scale and measuring by percentage, assures consistent results with regard to color and finish quality of the foam. It is also recommended practice to add any pigments to the B side of urethanes due to storage and shelf life concerns. The A side tends to be more sensitive to moisture and other contaminants. So assuming that you're finished up using your foam for the day, what are the best practices to store the liquids for future use? Unopened, our foam systems have a shelf life of six months from the date of shipment. This means that once you open the sealed containers, your shelf life depends entirely on the environmental conditions you expose the materials to. For example, moisture from humid conditions can negatively affect the material. To help preserve the shelf life of the foam, we recommend you reseal the containers as quickly as possible to minimize exposure. It's a good practice to wipe the threads clean of any residue and purge the containers with dry nitrogen gas. BJB has found that dry air products sold in aerosol cans 
are not nearly as effective as dry nitrogen sold at many welding supply stores. As a final tip, try wiping a thin film of petroleum jelly on the threads to prevent the container lids from sticking the next time you go to use the material. We hope you've enjoyed this video and found we've taken some of the mystery out of polyurethane foams. Don't forget to read the product data sheet for more detailed processing requirements and safety precautions on the BJB material you're using. These are included with your shipment of material and are available for download on our website, which is where you can also find more videos and helpful information on other BJB products.